Cast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. Hello, it's Stacey Harris and Aaron Spencer. Um, and we're getting ready to kick off the annual HR System Survey internal webinar. Um, and hopefully, um, for those of you who have signed up or for those of you who registered who didn't get a chance to uh, participate live, um, if you have any questions um, or if you have any comments or, or feedback, please let us know. We are going to try and take questions and comments throughout the session today. Um, joining me also is Erin Spencer, who is my colleague. Erin, you want to say hello to everyone? Hi everyone, I'm Erin Spencer. I work with Stacy on the data and analysis of the HR system survey. So generally Stacy's the person who talks about this to our external audiences, but here we are together doing this today. Yep, so we are, and I hope everyone can see my screen today, um, just making sure it looks like it is going now. Okay, perfect. All right, well, we're going to kick off the 21st annual year. For those of you, I had someone who emailed me after I sent out the announcement about the webinar saying he can remember the first year, and I was thinking, boy, to go all the way back to the first year, but this is the 21st annual year that we've done the survey for everyone who hasn't had an opportunity to see it previously. We've been uh, doing it um, since... 1987, right, Aaron? Was that the year we started, or 88? Uh, I think it should have been 87, 87, because this is the 21st year. So, yeah, so. 87, 88, and um, it has expanded and continued to grow. Um, for those who uh, may be new to um, the research or who have not had an opportunity to download it in a few years, um, it does now cover everything in the research, from strategy, process, and structure to the administrative applications, the workforce management applications, talent management applications, BI and analytics, as well as emerging technologies um, and expenditure and usage. Erin, um, you want to talk a little bit about um, uh, what kind of response we got this year and how well yes. it did? So um, this year, I'm, I'm the data geek, we've got about 150 different distributors, um, including our internal team and external team. We've got um, associations and vendors and uh, our social reach, and we, we've got a huge, huge, huge um, group of people that distribute for us. So we had, um, we had 2,600 and some organ people really um, hit the survey and start to take it in some way. But we only keep individual organizations. So we, um, if there's, so for example, two people from IBM took the survey, we would take off one of them. So we cleaned down to um, 1636 individual organizations that answered enough of the survey for us to be able to include them in our analysis. And um, for those who um, are going to spend the next hour with us, Aaron and I really went through and decide, try to decide what was the most important things for the Sierra Cedar audience, um, what things might be helpful for your clients to know or for you to know about the clients that you're working with. And so that's where we're going to be spending in the next hour. We won't get into the entire survey this year. We did have, I think, over 100 and. 35, 36 pages in the report this year, so it has gotten a little bit um, large, and so we won't be able to cover all of it in the webinar today. Um, but we're going to start off today talking a little bit about what's happening in the HR technology budget. As I said, we're talking about everything in the HR technology uh, spending market and what organizations are using and what they're not using, and um, our function is hopefully to provide you insight as a CR Cedar um, uh, organization and uh, working with the clients on things that will be of value to your clients but also will help you understand what they're trying to do right now in the HR technology space and so one of the first things we tend to always look at is the spending will spending increase over the next um, 12 months and what we have generally seen is that the spending has sort of gone slightly up or slightly down in the last couple of years we haven't seen a large increase this year though we did see an overall a 10 percent increase in spending in the HR technology plans for the next 12 months um, now that's a pretty good increase and that increase um, also uh, went um, uh, much higher for organizations who were large and mid-market um, and so you'll see that in the report a little bit of detail that's broken out around that we also asked this year questions about what organizations were planning on increasing and decreasing in their spending. And this is the first year we asked this question, because previously we'd always asked if they were increasing their spending this year, we asked what they were planning on increasing or decreasing their spending in. And that ended up being, surprisingly, the talent management space, as well as the um, core HR space. But the core HR space is increasing as much as it is decreasing, although it was only a small percentage of organizations who were planning on it decreasing their spending, we are seeing some plans to decrease spending in the 
core HR space, one of the things I think we found, Aaron, was that when organizations were definitely planning on an implementation, they were also increasing their spending, correct? Yeah, absolutely. That it, it, it very much correlated with what you were planning on doing as far as like making a change to your software. So the uh, good thing for anybody who's working with clients out there is to really understand if they're doing a big implementation of their core HRMS or even evaluating their core HRMS plans, we'll generally see their budget go up for the core HR environment. If they aren't, then where we're seeing the budget go up is in talent management, business intelligence, and even workforce management in some cases these days. That is another area. And we'll talk a little bit about why those three areas are, are making some changes right now. All right. Um, there we go. The other thing that we wanted to cover in the front end of the conversation today, because we always get the question about what percentage of the market is going to be replacing their HR technology systems. And for the most part, the clients that we work with as CRC are, tend to be green space or tend to be, I'm sorry, replacement technology. They're not green space. They're not brand new SMBs putting in a brand new system. Usually they've had one or two systems, maybe they're on-premise, maybe they're hybrid environments, maybe they're even existing cloud. And what we found in our data this year when we broke it out by the organizations who either had all cloud applications, all on-premise applications, or hybrid applications, which meant they have both a cloud and an on-premise environment in their total HR technology space, we're looking at the HRMS, payroll, workforce management, talent management, is that those organizations who had the hybrid environments were the most likely at this point in time to both be planning to make a change in the next 12, 24 months, and that averaged anywhere from 17 to 20 percent, um, as well as evaluating um, their HR technology environment, and that averaged anywhere from 18 to 25 percent. So on average, you could say that organizations with a hybrid environment, about 40 percent of those organizations are looking to make a change over the next 12 to 24 months in their HR technology environment. On premise, similar numbers there. They were 19 percent um, to 13 percent in their overall HR technology space. Um, and they were also similar in their evaluations. As you can see, some of the areas where we're seeing the highest plans for replacement and the highest evaluation numbers are in that talent management space. That area is one of the areas that we're seeing considerably um, get a lot of attention in, in uh, shifting. Now, the other thing we, we looked at this year is if you have an all cloud system, are you also looking at doing some sort of change? And I think this was the interesting thing, right, Aaron? We found that those all cloud systems are actually still planning to make changes at some level, right? Yes, absolutely. Even for organizations that have had, when we say all cloud, it's not really like, uh, it's, so that's your HRMS and your payroll and your workforce management and your talent management all in the cloud. That, that doesn't mean that you were not planning on making change or that you weren't evaluating your system, but those numbers definitely were lower than organizations that were all on premise or had some sort of hybrid solutions. And what we're figuring is that after organizations go through their major transformations, um, if they have most of their systems in the cloud, then we can expect that on an average, we'll still have 10 to 15% of the market flipping every year. Um, so that number will continue to sort of stay standard, and that's definitely been what we've seen in the market. So we also took a look this year at what organizations were doing as far as deployment based off of the number of years that they've had their system in place um, and how that affected the change plans. Erin, this made a big difference as well, right? Right. And so this is something that we hadn't really looked at quite um, this way until this year. Um, but what we found was that large organizations um, have had their HRMSs longer on average than medium or small organizations and that time deployed goes down um, by size. Now, um, you can look at that aggregate, just so you know, um, when we're talking about our data, about 50% of our responses come from small organizations, um, and then about 30% from medium and 20% from large. So um, the aggregate is heavily weighted towards small and medium organizations, but you can see that for large organizations, uh, that's over 10,000 employees, on average, they've had their HRMS deployed for over eight years. and. Then when you look at this by change plan, so that's the um, the figure kind of on the right with a little calendar with a no symbol. If you're not planning on making a change, on average you've had your core HRMS on just over four and a half years. If you're planning on making a change, almost seven years, definitely planning on making a change in the next 12 months, you've had it for about eight and a half. And then here you see for 24 months, um, you're planning on making a change in the next 24 months. On average we see that um, being 10 
years that you've had your current HRMS. So basically, the longer you've had your system, the more likely you are to make a change. So I. I, I know that, that for you guys, especially for the salespeople, you're like, ah, yeah, absolutely, that makes sense. But, you know, when you look at this, you're like, anybody who's had their system for uh, essentially eight or more years is definitely going to be a whole lot more ripe for change than anybody who hasn't had their system at least five years. Yeah, and so when we're looking at sort of who to outreach or maybe who to touch or maybe who to spend more time with, the expectation is that anyone in that eight to ten year zone is definitely um, – a, a possible target, as Aaron said. So great. Um, we also wanted to understand a little bit of who's struggling the most with their core HRMS and provide you guys that. So this is insights in the data, and we thought this would also be valuable. Uh, one of the ways we figure that out with um, is by asking organizations whether or not their current HR system always meets their business needs. Now, we have this data on more than just HRMS this year. We have it on talent management, workforce management, as well as payroll. We're going to just show the um, HRMS data here, but we have the similar kind of insights in all the other areas as well. Um, and what we found was that organizations who said they were more likely to always say that they that the HR technology currently meets their current business needs fell on those areas like business professional services, high tech, finance. The areas that were struggling the most that felt that the systems weren't meeting their needs on a regular basis um, were more in the areas where we tend to focus as clients, um, healthcare, government, education, nonprofit. Those organizations, without a doubt, do not feel that the current HR systems, new or old, it doesn't matter, but that the current HR systems that they have they currently feel that they do not meet their business needs. And that's a bit of a challenge because this covers cloud solutions, existing solutions, as well as um, on-premise solutions. None of them are falling in this high category right now. So something to keep in mind, I think, as you're going out looking at your clients and your customer base. The other thing we came out of this year that we think is really important to understand as you're sort of looking at your clients and sort of talking to them about what's happening in the HR technology space is this understanding about how much making a transformation to a new HR technology environment it's going to cost. Now, one of the things we always tell people is that when we look at numbers in our research, these are averages. These are averages of what people give us of the spending that they are currently have in place on their entire HR technology environment. Um, so that's a wide swath. People who have a lot of systems, people who have a little bit of systems, all of those things, right? But one of the things that we are able to, to look at because of the amount of questions we ask, because of the depth of the research that we do, is not only how much organizations are spending, but what they're getting for that spend. And so what we found is that, on average, organizations are spending less money per employee. The way we look at this is $214 per employee is that cost, is spending less money per employee whether when they're, on average, an all on-premise environment, a hybrid environment, which maybe has a mixture of both on-premise and cloud, or mixtures of maybe multiple environments, versus an environment that's all cloud. So all cloud environments tend to be per employee about 40, 50 percent, well, not quite 50 percent, about 40 percent more on average. Um, so basically what we're seeing is that those organizations spend 29 percent higher from a cost perspective overall from that all on-premise environment. But we also found that they are getting more per employee in the total technology that's being offered. So on the right-hand side of this chart here is the average number of applications they're getting for that total cost. And what you're finding is that organizations who have an all-cloud environment are getting paying 29% more per employee, but they're also getting 43% more per application. And this is a really important component that came out of our research this year. It's a little bit hard to explain, but really important to understand if you're someone who's working with clients who are trying to make decisions about what they're doing. If their focus is totally on savings, everything's about return on investment, moving to the cloud is, is very likely not going to get them an opportunity to reduce costs in their organization. What that is going to get them, though, is more value per dollar, more systems per dollar. So what that is more likely to get them is a return on value. And so you really want to understand when you're working with your clients, what is it they're trying to achieve with their HR technology environment? Erin, did I explain that well? I mean, this this is one of the more complicated areas. In <laughs> yeah, our and it's so hard because one of the things we ask is, you know, what do you – 
how much do you spend, and then on what systems do you spend? So someone could have um, a recruiting system, and someone could not have a recruiting system, and it, so all of these these numbers are absolutely um, ballpark. Not, not ballpark, ballpark, but they're very much aggregate averages. So if you have specific questions on how much people are spending um, based on different numbers or different industries or something like that, and you need Stacey or I to break it out, please send us an email. Um, ask us for some extra information. This is just really a very high level data. Yeah, um, we try as much as possible to give people a point that this is a starting point. This is not an end point when you're looking at budgets. But the bigger point here is if, if you've got clients who are trying to do return on value, trying to increase what they're trying to get out of their systems, trying to show more value to their business leaders, cloud is definitely the way to go. You just get more for your money. If you've got organizations that are solely focused on savings, solely focused on every dollar having it showing a return on investment, it is a much harder case from the cloud environment. Not to say that's not the direction they want to go, but they may want to think about it in the terms of how much am I willing to spend because you will spend more in general with cloud. And we've seen this now a couple of years, year over year. Um, and so those are some of the things we're finding in the data set. All right, we're going to shift gears a little bit. Those were some of the big things we thought were important to sort of pull out from budgets and where people were spending their time and what they were doing from a technology turnover, which I know is always a big question for us from uh, the members of our internal team because you guys are always trying to work with your clients and figure out what percentage of your clients or which clients should you be talking to about things like HR technology transformations. The other thing that we did this year, which I think is really, really important, is that we really took a look at how organizations were doing their HR technology adoption. Now, most of you who followed the research for the last several years were probably familiar with what we called our Sierra Cedar HCM application blueprint. This has been um, updated and edited year over year to add in what was happening in the total HR technology market how organizations were deciding on what processes they were going to be focusing, what processes aligned with various application tools, and how all of those things sort of fit together, generally in a very linear way. In this environment, organizations always focus generally first on their core HRMS and their payroll solutions, then some of their self-service solutions, and then we might see some talent, and then we might see from workforce management. But there was very much a, a, a more um, sort of standard linear approach to how we filled in the process map for HR technology environments here and all the other pieces and parts that flowed around it. This year we went back to the drawing board and we said, look, what we're seeing is that organizations are no longer making HR technology decisions focused solely on the processes. What we're seeing this year is that they're making HR technology decisions based more so on what's happening in their organizations from a strategy perspective from a cultural perspective and from a data governance perspective. Now this may seem like you might sort of scratch your head a little bit and say, okay, that's a lot of very important elements, but what does that have to do specifically with which HR technology you're selecting? Well, what we're finding is that because most of the HR technology today is very commoditized, commoditized and very much folk, everyone sort of does about 80% of the same things in a lot of those technologies, the focus isn't on features and functions or process mapping. The focus now is on does this technology meet the needs of my organization's strategy and outcomes? Does it fit me culturally in how it looks, how it feels, how it performs, what kind of data it capturing? And does it meet my needs as an organization from a reporting and output perspective and data governance? And so that's a big part of what we've seen happening in the shift in how organizations are making their decisions around HR technology. They're starting now at a different place. And the next thing that we're seeing is that when they're thinking about their HR technology environments, they're no longer focusing just on sort of, I'm going to do payroll and core HRMS and I'll wait for a couple of years and maybe then do some talent or I'll wait for a couple of years and maybe add some emerging technologies. We're seeing much more of a cohesive look at HR technology environments where organizations are saying, look, my core HRMS is important. Maybe I have to think about a portal at the same time. Maybe I have to think a little bit more about talent. Maybe emerging technologies, things like benchmarking databases are just as important and those have to be part of my HR technology decisions. So the process of selecting technology has become much more holistic and organizations are looking at technology that either meet all of those needs, 
have partnerships that meet those needs or have good integration so that they can meet their needs across the board. So the selection process is becoming more holistic. And then secondly, we're also seeing on the outer rims um, much more um, focus on the enterprise systems as a entire conversation that I'm having and the enterprise processes. So the processes now are things that wrap around my technology needs and those are things like my data privacy processes, my content strategies, my workflows, my integration strategies, network security, cybersecurity, they're all part of making the HR technology decision. They're not driving it, the drivers are strategy, data governance and culture, but they're important in the discussion. And on the very outer rim of this um, hexagon um, uh, um, HCM application blueprint that we have built is this look at all the other enterprise HR technology environments. This is really important to realize that no HR technology environment sits as a um, island. Um, they have to fit within the picture of the finance technology, the customer relation technology, vendor management, and even now in your workforce productivity technology like your Microsoft Office environments, like your Google environments in some organizations, those tools are now capturing as much data and need to be integrated as succinctly as all your other enterprise technologies into what's happening in HR. Erin, I know this is a space that you and I worked really hard on trying to figure out. Anything else you'd like to add to this picture that, that I might have um, missed? You know, the I think the important thing about this picture that's so different from the last blueprint is that really every little piece of this can work together. It's not like one thing, then another thing, and then another thing. Like you can choose one. You can choose to have payroll and core HRMS and benefits. You could also have, you know, absence of leave, and then you could have some sort of wearables, and then you could have onboarding, but you could not have all sorts of other things. Um, you know, a, a lot of this is really what organizations really want to have as part of their overall strategy, which is um, what we're going to talk about a little further into the presentation. Yep, and this is definitely much more aligned with what we're seeing organizations from a make from a decision making process. So if you have more questions on this, please let us know. But um, this is the direction we're definitely seeing in the research as well as everything else taking. All right. So what is driving the outcome? So so one of the things I mentioned in that blueprint is that organizations are making these decisions with their HR technology based off of what outcomes they're trying to achieve, what strategy they have, and the outcomes they're trying to achieve. So Aaron and I went in and we said, okay, well that's we need to really start to figure out what are actually creating business outcomes, HR outcomes and talent outcomes from the HR technology practices. Is it very specific vendors? Is it very specific technologies? Or maybe is it some other things that are happening? And and this was kind of, of interesting, Aaron, because you did the analysis. It wasn't any specific technology, right? That no, it and it was it was almost kind of funny because Stacy and I are looking at this. And we what we would have liked to prove that a, if you have a certain vendor, you have better business outcomes. I mean, the vendors would have liked that. We would have been interested to see that. There was no correlation, no statistical correlation between what you had um, vendor wise and what your business outcomes were. Um, it. What mattered was how you behaved and what you did. So, if Stacy's gonna flip to the next slide. Um, one of the things that I mentioned earlier was HR system strategies. Um, we've So Stacey and I have been here since 2014 and we've seen the percentage of organizations with a, a regularly updated HR system strategy kind of pretty much hover around 30%. Um, but A, we're big fans of strategies and B, we were really excited to see that for 2018 we saw a 52% increase in organizations that now had an HR system strategy. It's still under 50%, um, but it's better than just 30%. And organizations with an HR system strategy that was regularly updated had 10% higher outcomes than organizations without a regularly updated HR system strategy. So having a strategy is important and it really does show itself in higher outcomes. Um, one of the other things that we also saw creating higher outcomes, 19% overall, was for organizations that did have a culture of change management. So you can see in our little chart here, we break out small, medium, and large. We do that very frequently because often small and medium organizations lag behind large in certain things. Um, as you can see here, larger organizations, 39% of them have a culture of change management, whereas we see that for only 27% of medium organizations and 23% for small organizations. Now that doesn't mean that those organizations don't do any sort of change management. Um, as you can see, we go from culture of change management to key projects, then sporadically, then never, and really, um, 
only 3% of large, 2% of medium, and 7% of small never do change management. But um, we also know that for organizations that use have a culture of change management, they're more likely to be viewed as contributing strategic value to the overall organization, HR is anyway, than organizations that never do change management. So that makes a difference there too. So if HR wants a seat at the table, which we'd really like because that influences buying decisions um, for our software and allows us to have more conversations about talent and talent management and succession planning and all of those fun things that I love to think about, um, it really makes a difference to how you're viewed in your organization. So we have business outcomes, and we have how you're viewed in your organization as being important factors for having change management. Yeah. And the, thir the next one that we have here is integration strategies. And I think this, you know, Aaron, we've seen for many years that, that an enterprise HR system strategy and a change management strategy have been, had an, a correlation with what happens in your business outcomes. And we've started to see in the last couple of years that integration strategies have that same correlation. Now, it's interesting because most organizations, over 50% of organizations, make decisions about their HR technology integration approach based on a case-by-case -case basis, which means they're kind of like, well, something comes in, I've got to do an integration, let me see what APIs they have, let me connect maybe to my you know, enterprise HR system, maybe I'm going to connect it to my talent management system, I'm not sure which, but there's no standard process or decision as an organization about how all of my system technology integrates. But 20% of organizations, and this has not changed year over year, it's stated around 20%, has said they have a, an regularly updated enterprise integration strategy. So you think it's only 20% of our data set. Those organizations who had a regularly updated enterprise integration strategy not only saw improvements in their in their usability and in the adoption of their technologies, but they definitely saw 12% higher outcomes as well. And so this is another area where we're seeing something that seems very sort of um, Something that, well, I'll get to it when I get to it, right? Something that I can can do maybe in my spare time. These little things make such a big difference in the outcomes organizations achieve from their HR technology investments. And then the final one is, is a little bit of a different one. One of the things we asked this year was really about how organizations were utilizing their HR technology. This was a new question we added this year. We wanted to get a sense of whether or not organizations were leveraging their HR technology to just replace their paper-based systems, to replace their, to make sure their managers and employees could just input and access information. And that's about 80% of organizations were doing using their HR technology for those things, which is good to see, right? That's that's not a bad thing to use your HR technology environments for. But the big conversation that's happening in the market, if you've been listening to anybody talk about HR, is we want HR data to help us make business decisions or to inform our business strategy. Just 38% of organizations were using their HR technology systems to inform business strategy. And I did a little bit of digging on this, and we looked at our data a little bit, and one of the things we asked was, well, why all these systems that everybody keeps touting are supposed to be helping people make business decisions, why aren't they using them that way? Because even the most simple HR technology environment these days has reporting tools and environments where they can go in and see dashboards, and what we found is that only 10% of organizations were actually tracking the adoption and use of their technology. So a lot of the conversations that we've had with organizations is, well, you know, not everybody fills it out, not everybody's using it the way we need them to use it, not everybody is, um, you know, getting the kind of information in there that we need to make better business decisions or to make better workforce decisions. And that, I think, is the crux of what we found this year is that just putting a system in place, just filling it with data that you might already have in other systems is not the most effective way to use your HR technology environments. And it definitely doesn't get you to the top of this um, uh, pyramid where we're really trying to get HR technology to help you inform your business strategy. And one of the key metrics that we're starting to see is that organizations have to track who's actually using their technology and what are they using it for. And those organizations who do saw a 10% higher business outcome than compared to any other organizations. And remember, that's only 10% of our data set. So that's a really small percentage of our data set who saw outcome changes because of it. And so what we found is that when organizations focused on those four things, they got better business outcomes. 
the other place they got better business outcomes was in the place we've been talking about for a while, which is when they focus their approach, right, Erin? Absolutely. So one of the really fun things that we can do with our data is we can break it out in lots of different ways because we have so many different questions on so many things. So um, as you, if, as those of you who are familiar with the survey may know, um, when Lexi Martin started doing this survey, she was trying to figure out a way to look at organizations who were doing something a little different than um, the aggregate data, data, data set so she could compare one to the other. So one of the things that we do with all of our survey responses is we look and see whether or not, or not they're a publicly traded organization. And for organizations that are publicly traded, what we do is we actually go out and look at all of their financial metrics that are independently verified because we do that ourselves. Um, so we go to Yahoo Finance and we figure out their revenue, their profit, their operating income growth, return on equity, a bunch of other financial things. And so we put organizations that are in the top 25% of those top quartiles of all of those things um, in the top performing category compared to non-top performing or organizations and we coin those as decisions that are based on financial performance. But there are a lot of organizations that aren't publicly traded and there are a lot of organizations that are, we can't get the financial data on to make that determination and it, so it leaves out a significant part of our data set, especially the smaller organizations that just aren't ever going to be listed on the stock exchange. So we wanted to come up with another way or two of looking at those organizations and so Stacy and I, the first year we were here, came up with the data-driven organization. This, are, this is a group of organizations that are making decisions based on data. They have mature workforce analytics, they use more metrics, they give people, managers and access to business intelligence, they use more data sources. But then we were like, oh, it's not just data, what about talent? So we added this third category, talent-driven organizations. Um, and those are organizations that engage in career planning, success and management, that use business intelligence metrics to look at outcomes for employee engagement, retention risks, and um, identifying top talent. And then last year we added in another category, the socially responsible organizations. Organizations that are in the top 10% of our social responsibility matrix question. Um, these organizations focus on diversity, family leave, flexible scheduling, wellness, employee engagement, et cetera. And all of these types of organizations, as you can see from the little thing on the bottom of each one of those columns, has higher outcomes, HR business talent outcomes than the aggregate group. Top performing 8% higher, talent driven 11% higher, data driven 12% higher, and socially responsible organizations 13% higher outcomes. Yeah, and we had a, a great question that was asked by um, uh, Lori around how are business outcomes defined. Um, that's actually one of the reasons why we started to do this research was because we always defined initially perf top performing organizations by their financials. And what we wanted to understand was that organizations maybe who had some more um, what we would consider long-term business outcomes, what were they doing? Um, and so our long-term business outcomes range in the area of, um, we ask questions about whether or not over the last 12 months organizations were able to increase uh, their talent um, within their organization, were able to um, keep their talent within the organization, were able to align their HR environment to their business environment. And then on the business side, we're asking questions like, over the last 12 months, has your organization's increased or decreased its ability to um, uh, increase their innovation within the organization, increase their profitability within the organization, increase their um, uh, uh, market share within the organization? So we ask a series of about 16 questions, right, Erin, to get to the outcomes within the organization? Yeah, we actually, um, well, we'll, we'll show in, in, in some of the next slides the eight. HR talent business outcomes and um, those generally have labels on them. We can define what they are. Yeah. Um, actually, I think I might have taken those out. <gasps> you took those off. Um, yes. <laughs> if you go to a report on one of the pages, you can see a list of all of the different outcomes. I mean, as you can tell, Stacy and I have so much data that it's hard to decide what you guys are what's going to be most helpful to a particular audience. So if there's something that you guys would really like to see or that you didn't think was helpful, please let us know. We're always trying to figure out a way to make things more useful to the people that we're talking to. Yeah, so there's a, a series of 16 questions, and it's on a scale of one to five. We've asked organizations whether in the last 12 months 
they have been able to improve or not or decrease uh, their ability to do these things. And there's five talent management specific outcomes, five HR specific outcomes, and five specific business outcomes that we ask. And then what you're seeing here are the aggregate numbers. In the report, we have charts that show all of that specifically to each type of outcome. Um, and so hopefully that will add value. It's one of the most requested areas that we get conversations about, but it's also a little bit of the most complex area to have a conversation about. So thank you for the question, Lori. We'll, we'll, um, uh, and if you want, you can email me. and I'll definitely get those to you um, directly. Um, we also have, um, and just kind of in summary, just to make sure that we're sort of giving you a sense of what, what we were trying to um, show here is that when organizations talk about what do I need to do to make sure that my HR technology investment gets me the most value, gets the most out of it, it's not always as important which vendor they go with. Now, every vendor has its own benefits. They should be looking at relationships, and they should be looking at long-term directions, and they should be looking at the applications that are meeting the various industry-specific needs. But what really makes a difference is how they think about it. Do they have an enterprise HR system strategy so they know what's coming first, second, and third in their environment? Do they have a continuous change management process? Do they invest in an enterprise integration strategy? Do they measure that HR technology adoption and figure out how to make sure people are using it? And do they define their um, what we consider their outcomes they're trying to achieve so that they're very focused on how they're using their HR technology, as we noted in the previous slides? So, we're going to make another shift here to talk a little bit about what's happening in the what we consider the new HR technology roles. So one of the questions we often get from the internal CR Cedar team is, well, well, can you give us more insight into our buyers or into the people who are making decisions in the HR technology environments? And so we started to add a few questions this year about what are the roles within organizations um, being asked to do? And particularly, we wanted to understand what's the difference between HRS HRIT roles that generally sit in HR but are assigned strategic roles and strategic um, ownership of technology environments or purely IT roles or functional HR roles in an organization or IT leadership or governance committees. And what we found when we asked organizations who was responsible for their HR system configurations is that there was a clear split between what was happening in the on-premise environments to those who moved to cloud environments. In an on-premise environment, we are definitely seeing that more often the organizations are giving responsibility to their functional HR roles, to their IT roles, and uh, in, in many cases than they did in the what we would consider the cloud environments. In the cloud env environments, we're seeing more um, responsibility shift from what was IT leadership or CIO in on-premise environments to what is now the um, HRIS, HRIT role for configuration decisions. But even more interesting was when we asked organizations who's owning security and privacy in HR, and this is definitely shifting from what is was traditionally the IT role. As you can see, 47% in an on-premise environment said that the IT role was responsible for security and privacy in their HR technology environments, particularly data privacy. And what we found is that when organizations moved to the cloud, that number dropped down to 34%, and we saw 48% of the HRIS, HRIT roles now were responsible for the content security and data privacy. This is a pretty big shift. So one of the things that we're seeing organizations really think about is who owns the budget, who owns data privacy, who owns configuration, and then now who owns my network security and my enterprise privacy. And those are splitting up pretty rapidly in this environment. Um, Aaron, we also asked them questions about cybersecurity as well, right? Right. So um, one of the other things we were trying to figure out was how does the cybersecurity piece fit into the overall HR technology space? Um, and we found that you know organizations were actually a lot more likely to have a cybersecurity strategy than an HR system strategy. Um, Sixty percent have an updated one that's updated regularly, um, and then we go down to rarely an in development, no strategy, and I don't know. Um, we did see a 30% increase here from 2017 in organizations that had a cybersecurity strategy. Um, and then, Stacy, next slide. Yeah, and it's no, it's worth noting that 85% of organizations have both their HR systems and their finance systems in that cybersecurity strategy. Yes. So, um, but along with the cybersecurity strategy, we ask some extra questions. So, one of them is whether or not your organization has a bring your own device policy. Um, we break this out by small, medium, and large. Um, and obviously, 
here we, we have a bring your own device policy and for most of us we work remotely so this isn't um, is, is not as relevant for us, but for our clients, certainly, who, who don't have the same work environment we do, this is important. Um, but one of the most important things was, you see our little black arrow that says concerning, uh, we see that 23% of small and medium organizations and 17% of large organizations have or no to bring your own device policy, but they still allow personal devices to access a work network. So that's, that's something that you might want to think about and bring up if people are talking to you about security and um, how that works. Um, we also asked about multi-factor authentication and remote white technology. Again, you know, here for us, in terms of sign into PeopleSoft to put in your time, we have multi-factor authentication and we have remote white technology. I'm sure that I'm not the only one who gets those emails from the IT, IT help desk about, you know, making sure that we have the right software on our phones and if something gets lost or stolen, here's the number to call, etc. Um, so we can see that the larger organizations an organization is the most, the more likely they are to have these tools in use, um, and then the smaller again, not quite as likely. Yeah, but I think it's quite fascinating to see that only about 50% of organizations right now are doing multi-factor authentication, and this is one of the questions that was requested by other HR professionals because they're very concerned about this data getting in the hands of wrong people, but a lot of their IT departments don't understand what's successful now on these HR systems in the cloud, so there's a lot of conversations happening here. The other thing that we looked at this year was HRMS implementation outcomes. So again, looking at the roles of, of people within the organization, what is the HRIT organization now responsible for? What type of technologies um, is the IT department now sort of responsible for putting in place? But also, when we go to do implementations, what's happening within organizations and who are they having to do some of the work. One of the first questions we asked this year, and this is a new question, is how would you rate outcomes of your HRMS implementation? Now, what was interesting is that in general, we asked organizations whether or not they fell short of their expectations, met their expectations, or exceeded their expectations. And things like expectations around the number of adoptions, remember, people aren't tracking that, so they're just assuming they're getting the adoption levels they want in some cases. But their adoption levels, they're, they're pretty comfortable with about over 70 percent of organizations felt they either met their expectations or exceeded their expectations. Same thing with budget. Organizations felt that in budget came in about where they expected it to generally about 70 percent of the time, right? 80 percent of the time. But what didn't come in as much on, in the, uh, met expectations or exceed expectations is timelines. So timelines, about 26% of organizations said they fell short of expectations around timelines. And the thing that seemed to have the biggest issue for organizations when they did implementation was resourcing. 34% of organizations felt that they had fell short of their expectations when they talked about resourcing for their implementation effort. And that I think leads to some of the questions that we then asked about who is doing your implementations. And not surprisingly, small organizations are more likely to use their internal resources and their system vendors versus a third party resource. Now, medium organizations are much more likely to use either internal resources or third party and less likely to use their system vendor for implementation services. And large organizations are pretty evenly split. They're about 53% of them use um, internal resources, another 22% use their system uh, vendor, and another 25% also use third-party organizations um, to help them with their implementation efforts. Um, we also want to understand this case, so great, this is good to understand when I'm doing implementations, what percentage of the work is being done by various um, people within my organizations. And these are averages, and so these are averages of what percentage of that work is being done by these various groups. But the one thing we also asked is, okay, great, what are they doing if they're doing the work? And what we have also found here is that this is a little bit of a hard chart to read, but it's it's called a waterfall chart. But basically the best way to read these charts, and you'll see these in the report so you can take a deeper look at them, is that the 80% of, so if you take the first one, testing and validation, 80% of small organizations here um, those organizations under 2,500 employees have testing and validation being done by internal so solutions. Another 53% also have some system vendor help in doing those um, testing and validation efforts. And about 7% of those organizations have a third party helping them with those testing and validation um, efforts within their implementation. So 
most organizations in the SMB market are using some form of internal as well, some form of external system vendor, but they're not using third party as much. If we shift this to medium organizations, this really shows up pretty clearly that what we're seeing is that organizations are spending a lot more time with their internal resources, over 92% of them are doing that testing and validation effort with their internal resources, but they're only using 18% um, of that testing and validation is being done by their system vendor, and now we're starting to see the third-party usage increase. And this is where we're starting to see where mid-market organizations don't expect as much from their vendor community for implementation support. This is why, so that 2,500 to 10,000 employees is kind of a sweet spot for any system implementers because this is where organizations are saying, look, the, the, the vendors aren't doing as much for me. I need to start looking at a third party to help me. When we get to large organizations, which is the next slide in this um, mix, we find that these organizations um, tend to use a little bit of everybody. They're using their internal resources, they're using their system vendor, and they're using the third party. Now, the things that tend to be done most often by third parties, no matter which solution, uh, which small, medium, or, or large organization is doing them, is the integration efforts, the strategy and guidance work, which is sort of a new thing for many of the system integration effort, um, organizations. Um, also, project management, which many of us know has been a long-term thing that we've seen in the system integration space and configurations. Um, but uh, you'll see that something like configurations is pretty evenly split between the vendor and the third party component, which again means more partnerships and relationships have to be created. So this is a deep dive of this. There's a lot more that we could get into if we had a lot of time here on the call. If you have some more questions, if you're trying to make some decisions about where you might want to spend some more of your time or learn some more tool sets or things, this is a great way to maybe take a look at that from the HR systems environment perspective. Um, and just sort of the wrapping up in that idea of what's happening in the changing HR technology roles, Human Resource now is owning more of the technology budget for HR systems. They're owning more strategy. They're owning their selection, their renewals, and their timeline, where previously a lot of that sat on the IT side. The HRIS, HRIT role now is owning a lot more of the maintenance, the integration, the employee data privacy, content governance, reporting and analytics, where IT now is being more held accountable to platforms, those network security issues we talked about, cybersecurity, um, data governance across the enterprise, um, and productivity applications like your Microsoft Office environments and how those are connecting from a data perspective. And then ultimately, system integrators seem to be spending much more time these days in strategy and guidance, project management, as well as the implementation integrations and configurations and ongoing maintenance. Um, and the system vendors themselves, particularly for SMBs, are doing a lot more for of everything, but they're also doing a lot in the systems training, configuration, and strategy and guidance space as well. So you're getting a, a different mix of what's happening in the technology market these days. All right, we're going to wrap up the conversation today talking a little bit about the HR technology landscape because we know it's always a question that comes out of the research, and it's always a question that everyone sort of comes to us and says, so we saw there was a where was a the X and Y axis, and here's where the various vendors ended up, and the, for those of you who don't know where the research um, has sort of progressed from this, over the last several years, um, we have started to track, um, and really we've done this probably since the beginning, but we've tracked it in different ways in different times, but we've always tracked some level of user experience and vendor satisfaction in the HR technology space. Originally, we only did it for the core HRMS. We now do it for all core HRMS workforce management, talent management applications. And every year, the vendors are very excited to see where they show up on this matrix. Now, one of the things that you'll see in the HRMS administrative application is that this whole market has very much sort of pushed together in the middle. We're not seeing a lot of vendors way out in front of anybody else. Um, Workday for many, many years was way out in front of everybody. We're starting to see some of that gap closing with um, organizations like UltiPro and Ceridian Dayforce. But one of the things that we do in our research, and it's really important that you take a look at this when you're talking to customers if they ask questions about some of these charts, is that this is on a one to five scale and a very minute uh, number between sort of three point 3.3 being the average and 
being the average and the user experience and better satisfaction, just small amounts of data sets can sort of change numbers here. And so when you're looking at this, just really note that nobody's doing really excellent. Nobody's doing really poor. A lot of people are in the middle here. Secondly, it's important to note that in the report, we have a lot of charts, things that are called complexity charts. And those complexity charts are really, really important because what you'll find is that many of these systems like the Oracle HCM Cloud, like the ADP solutions, like the uh, Chrono solutions, success factor solutions, they tend to be in the middle, but they also tend to serve the largest customer bases, 30,000 plus, the most global, the most complex. And those organizations have a lot more needs and requirements. And so their user experience oftentimes might be a little bit seen as, as more difficult or their vendor satisfaction might be seen a little bit more difficult because they have such complex needs. Um, where organizations, even in the workday environment to some extent, have lower per average um, uh, you, uh, number of users, definitely L2 Pro and Ceridian fall into that base where they're seeing much smaller um, organizations who are their clients, um, less likely to be global. That is not the case with Workday. They have lots of global clients. So this is one of the things to sort of keep in mind when you're talking to organizations about these tools. Um, they're very helpful to give a sense of what's happening in the market from a, uh, a user experience perspective, but they also need to be put into context. And we would recommend you take a look at those complexity charts. The big thing to note about the um, Core HRMS market right now is that it's really important to note that this market is very close. These are decimal points apart from each other when we're talking about this for organizations. Now, the space where that's not quite the case is in the talent management space. So the talent management space has organizations a little bit all over the place. The traditional talent management solutions like Cornerstone On Demand and People Fluent, which were all talent management suites, are definitely struggling a little bit. You're seeing them see lower user experience scores and lower vendor satisfactions than they've seen in many years. And part of it is we think that there is a, a huge issue going on in the talent management space. Well, people are a bit confused. What is talent management solutions in the light of the very big enterprise systems and many of the large core HRMS environments sort of including engagement and talent management elements within their environments as well. So is there such a, a need for a talent management suite? But we're also seeing a real emphasis right now on um, the fact that organizations, if they're going to be looking at talent management solutions as a point solution level, which is what they're going back to, they're looking for much better user experiences than what we're seeing in the average here. There was a 3% drop in the user experience and talent management overall. So organizations like Halogen or Ceridian or even Workday have seen their um, talent management scores increase because they've invested heavily in the user experience of their um, talent management solutions. And finally, the other space that really is wide and open at this point is the workforce management market. So workforce management is your time and attendance and your scheduling technologies. And it's really important here to note that in the workforce management space, organizations tend to have a lot of um, very detailed, very complex environments that they're using for scheduling and um, uh, time and attendance. And here we're seeing that organizations like Ceridian, who came out with their new cloud day force solution not too long ago, as well as Kronos that just came out with their new cloud uh, solution called Dimensions, this market is starting to break apart. We are seeing people start to take leads and this is a space where you're going to see a lot of commotion over the next 12 months because Kronos has their new solution out there, Ceridian's doing very well and just went public, and we also know that um, Ultimate just came out with their new um, in-system workforce management solution. I know Workday is working on theirs, and, we're, and we've been talking to ADP about working on theirs. So there are a lot of organizations investing heavily in this space. This is the time when organizations need to invest more. This will be the space where we'll start to see a lot of movement this year. And organizations aren't happy with their current vendors, and they're not happy with their current systems. And so a movement is here. Um, and then maybe, Erin, you can talk a little bit about what's going on with the non-cloud systems and their movement. So in the emerging tech section of the survey, we ask organizations about the non the the non HR systems, but their move to the cloud. So we can see um, for the last four years, what we have here is different types of systems. So we have sales CRM, marketing, finance, operations slash production, and vendor and supply chain management. And we can see overall for all three out of the four, we've well. For all of them, we've seen a change from 2015 to 2018, and that those have all been an increase, um, a significant increase, really. And so they match along 
with the move that we've seen to the cloud in HR. Um, we see sales CRM at 41%, marketing solutions 30% in the cloud, finance solutions 30% in the cloud, operations projection 27%, and vendor and supply change management 23%. That's a little bit lower than uh, last year's 25%, but again, our data set isn't exactly the same every year, so um, again, with the smaller sizes, that makes a difference too. So. Um, Definitely, we see cloud use has doubled in the last four years in non-HR systems. So that's important to know overall, because if organizations have moved to the cloud for one thing, um, they might be more willing to move to the cloud for another type of software. And cloud in these systems, in some cases, also means infrastructure as a service, not just uh, a total SaaS environment. So that's something to keep in mind, too. And then real briefly, we wanted to make sure we that you understood why organizations were making the moves, what was happening when organizations said they had a better user experience or lower user experience. What we found is that organizations this year are continuing to say that the things that are their top challenges when they are not happy with their current vendor is high costs and poor user experience. And one of the things that I said at HR Tech, and I'll say it here, the high cost does not mean that people feel they are paying too much, it means that they are not getting enough value for what they're paying. So that goes back to that charge where we said, you know, cloud solutions, people tend to pay more and they tend to pay more and get more value. Remember, those cloud solutions have better overall user experiences. So the systems that people are paying the least for, which is in many cases are on premise, which have the lower, lower user experience and vendor satisfaction scores, are also the ones where people are saying they still feel they're paying too much for them. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about cost. It's much more about the what you're getting for the value of what you're paying, right? Um, we're also seeing that organizations, when they do give good high scores in their vendor satisfaction, they're looking at service and support. I know um, Ricky had asked something about standardization of questions. We'll get to that a little bit here in a minute. Um, but service and support and good vendor relationships have a lot to do with um, uh, process management here as well as things like integration. And those become big issues when organizations are talking about why they appreciate vendors. Um, so just real briefly on the HR technology landscape, as we're wrapping up today, we've got just a few moments left. Uh, just a reminder that you know the HRS market is reimagining itself, focusing on enterprise platforms, partnerships, data layers, integrations. So a lot of those systems in the core HRMS environment that we talked about where they're really just decimal points away from each other, the way they're starting to differentiate themselves, we didn't talk a lot about this, but the way they're starting to differentiate themselves is the fact that they have enterprise platforms, they have better partnerships, they have better data layers. That's not a features and functions conversation that's happening. Uh, and the talent management market, as we noted, it is confused. They are focusing on point solution leadership there. So you're seeing, for example, Cornerstone on Demand to try and take full lead again in the learning and development space, spending a lot of time focusing there where previously they would have focused on performance and other tools. Workforce management is beginning to break out of the out of the past and we're now seeing new cloud options being offered by all the major players that will have an impact on how people are making their decisions. I would definitely take some time to look at those solutions if you have it in the most recent class. As we said, non-HR applications are moving to the cloud and Satisfaction these days is based on cost and value, user experience and service, and configuration roadmaps down the road. So just a couple of things to keep in mind as you're thinking about the HR technology environment. Real quickly, as we're sort of wrapping up today, we're going to talk about um, emerging technology. We do want to mention that we do have a lot of data in the report about emerging technologies. I know that tends to be a question you oftentimes get and are sort of like, well, you know, you haven't even begun to think about how you're replacing your HR technology environment and you're asking me about chatbots and social networks. Um, so if you have questions about that, we do get a sense in our data of what organizations are using um, when they're interacting with their employees. Obviously, 91% of organizations interact most from a shared service center with their employees and email. But we are starting to see things like call centers increasing, particularly for large organizations. We're also seeing text messaging increase, particularly for small organizations. And we are starting to see the beginning of the use of things like live chat and chat bots. Um, so if you have started to get questions about that, there is some data and insights in the report about that. Um, we also um, have some updated information this year on things that I know they're important to our audience. Infrastructure as a service and platform as a service, two offerings that we offer. Those um, have increased by 62 and 43% in the last year. They're still being looked at as cost-saving tools and integration tools, and we're still seeing double-digit plans for evaluating those technologies. So there's still a lot of high demand for them. Um, we're also seeing a lot of demand in the intelligent systems, um, but please note that if anybody says they have true um, 
artificial intelligence or their machine learning and their technologies, it's still in its infancy. These are the building blocks of what organizations need to do to build out artificial intelligence. So things like benchmarking databases are the number one focus for organizations who are really serious about their artificial intelligence because to be able to do artificial intelligence, you have to have a large enough database set, which means you have to be attached to benchmarking databases. So this is the data as a service that Workday offers. This is the um, infrastructure data management models that we're seeing come out of SAP. This is Oracle's data um, uh, knowledge centers that they're um, talking about. This is where organizations are saying, I need to be connected to a bigger sense of data to be able to do artificial intelligence. And that's the place where we're seeing the most movement in this artificial intelligence conversation. 27% of organizations today are already part of some sort of a benchmarking database. Another 24% are evaluating that. You'll see that we are still in single digits in most other areas like predictive analytics or sentiment analysis, which is emotional analysis, even machine learning, robotic process automation. We've got a lot of questions about that from people uh, and blockchain technology, all single digits from adoption perspective, but all of them are double digits from an evaluation perspective. So people are talking about them. The report has information about them. If you have any specific questions, we can definitely answer that. So just wrapping up today, as we sort of uh, close the, the picture down, we wanted to say there are a lot of big theme changes in the report this year, a lot of new interesting stuff about how people are thinking about their technology differently. There's also, um, we also have some, uh, a global deck that is available now that's all the breakout of all the global organizations. Erin um, herself is working on a healthcare breakout deck that we'll have done November 16th. Uh, we're working on a higher ed and a public sector breakout deck that will come on the uh, latter half of November. Um, we are still finishing up our finance and supply chain systems white paper. Um, that edition will be out in February of 2019 for the second annual one. Um, and there are still our plans to do an Asia Pacific breakout because we have a, a partner over there who does that for us for our, our India Asia Pacific market. Uh, that will be in May of 2019. Um, and if you're looking ahead, we are going to do the big launch April 8th of next year's 2019-2020 survey. So it always starts back over one year at a time. So um, Aaron, do you want to tell everybody a little bit about our webinar that's coming up as well? We're going to do a public webinar? Absolutely. For um, the stuff that you just saw, obviously we won't um – quite cover the same things that we're covering for you guys, but we've got a lot of data and we're going to do a public facing webinar on Thursday the 29th. Um, so anybody, if you have clients, customers, friends, neighbors, uh, et cetera, who's interested in the HR technology space, please send them our way. We'd love to have the opportunity to share the information from the survey with them. Yeah, and we'll cover more broadly topics there. We won't get into what will be important to Sierra Cedar in that one. So um, so I want to say thank you to everyone who took the time to listen to us. I know it's a lot to take an hour out of your day. We didn't get to half the things that we normally would, such as um, the adoption trends and the various things going on in workforce management or learning or recruiting or what's happening with, you know, the client feedback that organizations are giving various vendors, implementation timelines, um, and lots of large new and small breakouts in industries. But if you want any of that or you see anything in the report that you would like some specific answers to, please feel free to reach out to Aaron and I. Um, if you have any questions that we didn't get to, please feel free to put them on what we can answer them real quickly. I know, Ricky, you asked a question about of people, I, I want to make sure I'm reading this correctly, but of people, processes, and top technology, where does standardization and process improvement stand? Is this related to less customization? Oh, I think you meant in the um, in the slide where we were talking about um, what organizations were looking for from their vendors. Um, yes, yeah, so the reason organizations are looking for more um, customization or less customization is because of, we're finding at least the conversation is industry issues, which fits, I know Ricky, you're very focused on the healthcare space. What they're saying is that these technologies are great to meet sort of the 60, 70% of what I need them to meet, but they are not meeting my industry specific needs, which are really much more business performance needs. And so that standardization versus process improvement is process improvement from an industry perspective. Um, and so we are seeing a lot of organizations really start to take a industry focused look at what they can do to make their technologies, um, even if they're SaaS, very industry tailored. Um, and that's definitely one of the benefits people have in the PeopleSoft environments or in the on-premise environments for SAP and why many people are sort of hesitant to get off those technologies as because they've been able to customize them and, and uh, for specifically for their industry. So, All right. Any, any other questions before we wrap up today? I know we're a little over. 
Okay. Well, I think um, we're going to wrap it up and close it up. Any last minute comments for anybody, uh, Aaron, before we go? Just thank you guys all for attending. And again, the white paper is available for free. Please download it. Not that you guys would have to pay. It's internal. But, um, you know, we really do have so much information that we're happy to share with you. If you need us to talk to you, if you have any questions about anything, please feel free. Reach out to us. Let us know. And thanks, everyone. Um, if you have any customers or clients who have specific questions, please send them our way as well, or at least get in touch with us. We'll make sure we get you the answers as quickly as possible. So thanks, everyone. Have a good afternoon and a good holiday season. Bye. Bye.